I always worry when somebody tells me, can I be honest with you? <laughs> well, weren't you in the past? I mean, I don't know. Are you just lying to me all the time? And so James chapter 5, we're getting towards the end, and I'm really trying to condense this down, but every time I start to get into it, I'm like, oh, man, there's so much here to unpack. And so it's going to be a few more weeks to get through some, some verses here, but I think it's very impactful for the church. And the reason that I, I took uh, just verse 12, I don't like preaching just off of one verse, but I think it's important as, as we read this and we understand the whole book of James, where James is writing to a church. Remember, James starts off and says, hey, guys, I'm no better than you, even though I'm Jesus' half-brother. I'm no better than you. I'm a bondservant. I'm a slave just like you. And he says, hey, all these things are going on. Yeah, I know you're being persecuted. I know you're suffering, and you're doing some things that you shouldn't be doing, and that's part of the reason that you're suffering. But you're also suffering because you're doing some things right. You're, you're, you're serving God. You're living for Him. And He puts all of this into perspective for us here that we have to endure some persecution. We will face that persecution. We will face those trials and tribulations. And I, I like how in verse, uh, I'm going to back up to verse 11 um, from last week. Let, let, let's start at 10, okay? I'm, I'm sorry. We're going to start at verse 10 and kind of give an overview of last week here. It says, My brethren, take the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of the suffering and patience. Because we looked at those prophets, you know, Moses, Elijah, all these guys that went forward, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. And you have heard of the perseverance of Job. Job, a man who lost it all. He had everything. He lost everything he had, yet he never cursed God. And you have seen the end intended by the Lord and that the Lord is very compassionate and, ver and merciful. And so he's telling the church, he said, you're not the only ones. You're not the only ones that ever go through this stuff. And so as you're looking at your life, he's telling them, you need to understand, you need to do some things that are different than what you did before. And what he says to him right here in verse 12, but above all, Above all of the persecution, of all the trials, all the tribulations, of all the things that you do, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be your yes and your no your no, lest you fall into judgment. I think it's powerful when we stop and we look at that. Let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. And so I... I we all know that, that one person where we, every time they tell us something, we kind of wonder, are they telling me the truth? You know, they, they, they tend to stretch things a little bit. They embellish. You know, they lie, right? So how do you know if some people are lying to you? Well, my dad always said because their lips are moving, right? You know, so like politicians, how do you know a politician's lying? Their lips are moving. You, you, you know they're lying to you, and you're holding on to your wallet, right? You're going to make sure that they don't get something from you. And we live in a world of people who don't even think twice about it. They will lie to you because they are fallen. We live in a fallen, sinful world. And people will do whatever they need to do or whatever they think they need to do to get what they want. And sometimes it surprises us, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't surprise us that the world around us will lie to us at the drop of a hat to get what they want because Jesus told us that this would happen in John 8, 44. He says, you, speaking to the Pharisees, you are of the father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. For he was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So he's telling us, you guys are a bunch of liars because you belong to the devil himself. And so what we need to understand, and this is, this is hard for us to grasp sometimes, is that a person who chooses to continually lie to people, 
They're proving something to us. They are proving that they are an unconverted sinner, that they are not a child of God. Maybe they come to church every single Sunday. I don't know, but they have never given their heart and life over to Jesus Christ. They've never truly believed in him, and their words and their actions are showing us that. That's what Jesus is telling the Pharisees. You guys know the scripture. You know everything. You know all the rules. You know all the regulations. You know all the ceremonies. Everything that's involved with that, you understand it, but yet you choose to be like your father, the devil. Now, as much as we would like to be able to, we can't make other people tell the truth. All right, we, we, we can try. We can try to convince them to tell us the truth, but we can do something about us. We can do something about our words, the things that come out of our mouths. And what we need to understand, and this took me a long time growing up to understand, the truth will always come out. The truth always comes out, and it's Far, far better to tell the truth up front, even when it hurts to tell the truth. I'm always amazed at school. When I started teaching, you know, we had to play like um, CSI detective, basically, you know, to find out if a kid was lying or what they were doing, if they were telling us the truth in a situation. Now we just pull up the camera and go, there you are. And even to this day, kids are like, that's not me. I'm like, that's you right there on the camera. No, nope, no, nope, that's not me. Not me. Not me. I mean, they, they will lie, lie, lie. And, I, and I'll never forget this growing up. Um, my dad had a friend of his that was in the military with him. And I was like 15 years old, I think. And th this, I, I won't say his name because I doubt he's watching. But anyway, um, I remember he, um, he had a problem with marital indiscretion. Put it that way. And he got caught in the act. And I was there um, at, at, um, at, at his house one day, and my dad was like, man, you got to stop. You know, you're, 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 you're destroying yourself. You're destroying your marriage and blah, 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 blah. And on and on, my dad went, and he goes, John, John, you don't understand. He says, even when they catch you, you just deny, deny, <laughs> deny. And you tell them. You didn't see what you thought you saw. And they'll eventually believe you. And there's people out there like that, that they will just continually lie to you, lie to you, lie to you, and try to get you to say, oh, maybe my perception of reality is all messed up. When in reality, if they would just tell the truth in the beginning, it would be so much better for all parties involved. And so, yes, the truth hurts, but we have to be honest with each other in everything that we do. And so many times we try to cover it up and bury and hide our sins. And what um, James is writing to here and what Jesus is speaking to in, in Matthew that Mark read to us is that the Pharisees were trying to have an end around. So they were trying to figure out a way that they could lie and make it okay. And so the first thing that we see is that we have to put first things first. He says, but above all, above everything else that you do, my brethren, above all, whatever you do, do not swear. And he's not talking about using four-letter words right here. Although that's not good, that's addressed other places in Scripture. That could be a whole other sermon. He's talking about something else. And he begins by setting this importance with the people around him. That they need to control their speech. And this isn't the first time he's done this. He's done this throughout the book of James, focusing in, and remember, on the proper use of the tongue. Talking about the tongue being a fire. How it is this little tiny uh, member. It's just a few ounces. Yet it can set a whole country ablaze and destroy all sorts of things. He understands James understands this, and he's trying to get the church to understand this, that the tongue is the primary proof of a living faith in Jesus Christ. See, if you're a born-again person, you've believed in Jesus Christ, you've repented of your sins, and you're living for Him, you will seek to control your tongue, and the lost person does not. Now, notice I didn't say your tongue will be perfect says you seek to control your tongue. The lost people, the, the, those who don't know Jesus Christ, they just say whatever they want. And they, most of the time, they don't even worry about the consequences because they're doing what they want to do. 
And see, James isn't the only one, again, who's placing an emphasis on this. Jesus said the same thing about the proper use of speech in Matthew 12, verse 34. I love how he starts this statement off. He's looking at the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the day, the rulers, and he doesn't say, hey, guys, come here. I have something to tell you. He says, you brood of vipers. I, that's really not a compliment. I mean, <laughs> you guys remember uh, Indiana Jones, the, the first Indiana Jones you know, and he falls into the, the pit and he looks around and it's just nothing but asps, you know, snakes, vipers. You know, that, that's what I think of. I, I, I think of all of these poisonous snakes just everywhere, all around us. That's what he's calling them. You just pile of poisonous, venomous snakes. That's what you are. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says, you guys are so evil, you can't even know what the truth is. You can't even speak the truth because your heart is so corrupt. That's why James says, above all, above all things, don't swear. And so our speech reveals the kind of person that we are. This is why the proper use of our words has to be a priority in our lives. Proverbs 21, 23 says, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. I find myself getting into a lot of trouble because I let my mouth speak before my brain engages. I do that a lot. And Proverbs tells us you need to guard that mouth. You need to guard that tongue because when you do, you keep your soul, you keep your life from inviting trouble in, your words will always betray the condition of your heart. Once they come out, you can't stop them. So he says, first off, brethren, above all things, you need to guard yourself. So what is it that we need to guard ourselves against? This no-no, as I put in the notes. It says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Again, this is not... You're not going to walk around, you know, cussing and swearing and calling people names and doing this or whatever it is. Um, I have this discussion all the time at, at, at school with kids. And I, I tell them, hey, in my classroom, this is what's acceptable. This is what's not acceptable. We all know what the big letters are or whatever. And, and, and we talk about it. And, and I want to make sure kid, kids understand that it's not acceptable language. So that, that, that is a total separate issue here. What James is referring to, the word swear in this case, is not, again, profanity. But he's talking about a promise or an oath that was made. And so what we need to understand, this is way different. This is kind of like, a, I guess, like a handshake deal that people used to make today. Now, if it's not written down, you'll have 27 lawyers sign off on it. It's not good, right? So during this time, during ancient times, before there were written contracts, people would bind their agreements with a verbal oath. They would swear to do something, and then they would call on God to witness whatever it is they did, witness their words, and then they would invoke and say, if I don't do this, I want God's judgment to fall upon me if I fail to follow through in our oath. And it was a binding agreement. It was just like going to the courthouse and signing on a piece of paper. But, as I alluded to earlier, the Jews found a workaround, or so they thought. So they believed that this was only binding, the, the oath or the agreement, swearing to, it was only binding if they swore in the name of God himself. So if they swore to anything else, they believed their oath to be an unbinding oath, and it could be broken if necessary. So in Matthew 23, where Mark read to us um, today, Jesus talks about this. He says, you're, you're a fool, you're blind. Whoever swears by the temple and says that it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he's obliged to perform it. And then he goes on, he says, for which is greater, the gold of the temple or, or that that sanctifies the gold? So if I you know, swore an oath to the, to the four walls of the temple, that was okay to break that one because it was just the walls. But I can't... Um, it, they're, they're trying to get around it so they don't break that oath and invite God's judgment 
on them. And so he tells the Pharisees that an oath that is given in the name of anything, anything in all of creation, so even if they built it with their own two hands, that God gave them the ability to do that, God gave them the strength to do that, when you give an oath under those circumstances, that is an oath before God, because God alone is the creator of all things. Now, I know some people take exception to that and think, well, God wasn't in my workshop when I built this. You know, God wasn't. No, 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 no. God was because God gave you a talent. God gave you an ability. God gave you gifts to do the things that you do. I mean, you guys have seen our beautiful little um, church outreach box out here. If you had asked me to do that, it probably would have been like a cardboard box, you know, with a little sign on it says free stuff or something like that. But we have David here who has an incredible ability that he's been gifted by God. And so God is the author and the creator of all things. And so by swearing by anything, anything at all, Jesus is telling them that is a binding oath and God will hold them accountable. And James is reminding them that, that your word and your word alone, regardless of what you swear to, must be binding. And so you have to tell the truth. Tell the truth and do what you've promised to do. Anything less than the truth is a sin, and God will hold us accountable for those lies that we commit. So, the cool thing is, is that there's a cure to this. There's a cure. We read on. And it says, but let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. So, James is using the exact same words that Jesus used in Matthew 5, where Jesus said the exact same thing. He says, but let your yes be your yes, your no, your no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So you don't need to add to anything. You don't need to take anything away. You just need to be honest with people. And so many times we try to, you know, make the story sound a little bit better, um, Carla will know who I'm talking about here, but um, I used to have a, a couple hunting buddies, and, and we had this one hunting buddy that we, we, we'd go out to our different stands or whatever, and when he came back, you know, he, if, if we saw five deer, he saw 15. And if I saw a 130-inch buck, he saw a 180-inch buck. And, but we, didn't, we never saw proof. We never saw proof. He was always adding to, and that's where Jesus says, no, yes is yes, no is no. You don't need to add anything to the truth because the truth speaks for itself. See, we need to speak the truth every time we open our mouth. In all things, in all times, because again, the truth will stand on its own. You can't destroy the truth. It doesn't need our help. The scriptures don't need our help. The truth does not need a little bit of embellishment added to it. And we, as believers, as born-again believers, are to be known as people who speak the truth at all times. Our yes should always mean yes. Our no should always mean no. In Ephesians 4.25, Paul writes this. He says, therefore, therefore, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Put it away. Just tell the truth. That's the cure. We don't need to add to anything. See, when we lie to one another, when we embellish the truth a little bit, we lie to ourselves, and ultimately we're lying to God. Our lies, these untruths that come out of our mouths, reveal the lack of love for God, for our brothers and our sisters in Christ. When we lie, we're proving that we don't really care about the body of Christ, the church. When we are characterized by the lies that we speak, we prove that we truly don't know Jesus. That's harsh. That's harsh because it's so easy. It's so easy to do. It's just a little slip of the tongue. And there will be times when you're telling the truth and everybody looks at you and goes, mm, yeah, whatever. I don't believe you. Tell the truth anyways. You don't need to change it. You don't need to add to it. You don't need to take it away. You tell the truth anyways. Because the truth isn't always going to be believed and it's definitely not always going to be received by the people around you. 
But the truth, regardless of the fact, is always right. We see that happening to today's society, right? We see people saying, well, science has evolved. What is a woman? Oh, my goodness. I, I, I laugh every time I see those statements being made. And I'll have students tell me, and say, well, what if I want to identify? So you can identify whatever you want, but the truth of the matter is, still, you have an X, X chromosomes or you have XY chromosomes. That's the truth. Biology is biology. Truth is truth. And we as a society, as a church, need to come together, not only just Newburgh Chester, but as a body of believers, the body of Christ, and stand up and say, no, the truth is the truth, and it's always right. Regardless of your feelings, sometimes the truth hurts our feelings. There's no doubt about that. There's some times when I'm praying, I'm reading the Word of God, and, and, and I see the truth right there, and I know I'm not in His will. God doesn't say, well, <laughs> you just flip a couple pages of Matt and just forget about that. No, it hurts. But it's there for a reason because the truth is always the truth. And it's always right. We're called to be people, to be believers who are truthful, people of integrity, whose word is their bond. Boy, those days are gone, aren't they? Oh, well, did you get that recorded? Did you get that written down? My uh, all-time favorite, some of my older people will get this. You know, well, what's your definition of is? You know, you got, you, you, Greg got it. <laughs> you know, no, and we all know what happened, and we try to lie our ways out of it because it's difficult. And yes, sometimes the truth hurts, but it's so easy. Let your yes be your yes, your no be your no. That's all we have to do. What's the obstacle, the final obstacle here at the end of the verse? This is lest you fall into judgment. So this word, judgment, is a little different. It's the same word, root word, that has translated in other places in the Bible as hypocrisy. So let your yes be your yes or your no be your no. Otherwise, you're going to be exposed as a hypocrite. That's what James is telling them. He says, you need to be a good witness. People think of you as a follower, as a believer of Christ. But yet, when you don't speak truthfully, the truth will come out and you will be exposed. That's what he means by judgment. He's talking about that habitual liar, the one who lies constantly. They are proving that they don't know God. They are proving the lost condition of their heart. John the Revelator in Revelation 21.8 But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, man, some nasty people here. And the liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is a second death. See, a liar, a habitual liar, someone who does it all the time, over and over again, prove to the world around them that they don't know God and they will face an eternal judgment of God in hell. That's some old school fire and brimstone preaching right there. I mean, but, but the truth is the truth is the truth. We can't deny that. Now, James is not saying that you, me, Born-again believers are never going to mess up and tell a lie. That's not what he's talking about here. He is saying that someone whose life is marked by continual lying will face that judgment. They will be exposed as a hypocrite. People whose lives are characterized by this pattern of lying, they give evidence to everybody around them of their unregenerate heart, that they're really, truly not a born-again believer, that they're not saved. And so my question to you today, I mean, this is a short passage of Scripture, but I think it's very powerful for us because we tend to think of um, you know, pe people doing just terrible things with, with the words that they say. But are you guilty today? Maybe not being a habitual liar, but guilty of someone who's not watching their words. 
Are you guilty of trying to hide it to protect yourself, to make yourself better, or for any other reason instead of letting the truth speak for the truth? If we are, if we're in that position, we need to repent of that sin. We need to come before the altar of God and lay it down before him and consider whether or not we are truly living in God's grace. Because if it's something that we do without even thinking about and just just making things up on the fly and not letting the truth speak for the truth, then that says something about the condition of our heart, just as Jesus told the Pharisees. See, if you know Jesus Christ and you know the truth, if you know these things, you know that the truth should and must be lived out in our faith. People need to know when they come to you, if you say something, it, you know, something big is going to ha- ha- have to happen in order for you not to fulfill your word. Okay, so we, we all know those people. They tell us to do something and say, yeah, I'll never see them. It'll never happen. But I know that if, if David tells me he's going to be at my house and he doesn't show up, something happened. That something was there. I mean, let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Let people understand that your word is your bond and that we live out that truth in everything that we do. So what does your speech say about you today? Is it revealing of somebody who has been saved by the grace of God and transformed by his saving power? That should be the cry of our heart. That's what we need. Or does our speech betray our hearts as a hypocrite? Do people go, oh, yeah, that's just one of those guys, you know, they they go to church on Sunday, but (laughs) let me tell you what they do Monday through Saturday. One or the other is true. And that hurt when I was preparing this. One or the other is true. We're either marked as someone who has been saved by the grace of God and knows what the truth is, and the truth is the truth is the truth, or we're not, or we're a hypocrite. And how many times have we heard that? Well, I can't go to that church because it's full of a bunch of hypocrites. We're our own worst enemy. Our speech reveals our heart. So what's coming out of your mouth? Is it the truth or is it lies? Whichever it is, whichever it is, truth or a lie. It reveals the condition of your heart. And we have to be honest with each other. We have to bring that condition to him today. Repent and let Jesus Christ, through the power of his blood, through the power of his saving grace, transform our hearts. Transform the words of our lips into a beautiful sacrifice of praise that we offer up to him. That's what James is telling the church. Let your yes be your yes and your no be your no to be honest in everything that you do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word today. I thank you, Lord, for the power of your scriptures. And I just pray, Lord, that if there be anybody here or or watching online, Lord, who doesn't know you as their own Lord and Savior, that today is the day. Today is the day that they come before you and they lay it all out before you and they believe in you and make you master and Lord of their life. And Father, for those believers here today who are struggling in this area, who are struggling of grabbing a hold of the truth and sticking to the truth and understanding that your word does not need our help. Father, I pray that you would just continue to work in our hearts and our lives and that we just lay it out before you at the altar. That we come before you and we let your saving grace transform us to change our thoughts, to change our words, to change our actions, Lord, into that beautiful sacrifice of praise. Father, we love you, and I thank you for this wonderful congregation that you've blessed us with. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.